Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more of our virtual conversations. The breaking news today is that Richard Haas has written a book. Richard Haas is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. But this should come as no surprise. Richard Haas has written 14 books, but this one has been a runaway bestseller and has attracted critical acclaim throughout the foreign policy community. The book is called The World, A Brief Introduction, in which Richard makes the case that we must restore global literacy at a time of global crisis. We're pleased to welcome Richard Haas back to the program. Now, Richard, congratulations on the book, and perhaps you could tell me what you hope to achieve with it. Well, thank you, Jim. It's good to be uh, back on your show. Uh, alas, not in person, but we'll take, uh, we'll take virtual. The reason I wrote this, uh, and you, you encapsulated it uh, well, is the world is as important to the fate of people in this or other countries as it's ever been. Yet the level of knowledge about the world is in some ways less than it uh, traditionally has, uh, has been. What I decided to do was uh, to write a book that would help fill that gap. It's meant for students, high school, college, but also for, for any citizen. And the, the importance of being an informed citizen, I would think, is obvious. Uh, how to vote this fall, how to hold elected officials, appointed officials to account. If you're in business, do you put a plant in a certain country? As an investor, do you buy this or that uh, equity? As a tourist, do you go to this place at, at this time? It's, uh, I wanted to provide a foundation so people could make more informed decisions about their lives. And what I learned in the process of writing this book is not only what I didn't know, but we can't assume that most Americans or people elsewhere have this knowledge. You can graduate from virtually any of our colleges or universities and be functionally illiterate about the world. It's not that they don't teach the courses, but they don't require them as a condition of, of getting your uh, diploma. You could watch the nightly news for many nights and come away no wiser about what is going on in the uh, world. You can spend your life on the internet and again, uh, simply not find anything that's either about the world or what you find could be wildly inaccurate. So again, my goal here was to write a primer or what the Brits would call a primer, uh, one-stop shopping uh, to provide a, a foundation for people so they could make sense of all that of all that's coming at them. So is it possible that uh, someone today can graduate from say Stanford or from MIT uh, without any courses in history of the world or uh, foreign policy, foreign relations or, or civics, our constitution? It's not only possible, but it's commonplace. Again, don't get me wrong, virtually every one of these schools has a rich set of course offerings. The problem is most of them have distribution requirements. So they may say, you have to take two, three, whatever courses in the social sciences or social studies in order to graduate. The problem is they may offer 100 courses. So you can choose you know, Indonesian folklore and you can cho cho choose some uh, obscure piece of history or you know, the state of uh, women between 1822 and 1823. And I'm not disparaging that, but to, to be that detailed before you have a, a foundation, it worries me. It worries me in terms of our country, what you mentioned about civics. Why should we assume that our political DNA is automatically transferred from generation to generation? I don't. And I think one of the reasons our politics have become so dysfunctional is that it hasn't been transferred. People haven't read the Constitution, the, the Federalists, the Tocqueville. They don't, they don't have an understanding about, for example, how compromise has been a central part of American political tradition, or they haven't you know, learned the first thing about the world. So when someone says, I want to have a, a tariff, or someone says, I want to put troops in here or pull them out of there, or let's get out of this agreement or sign that one, how are they supposed to have a reference point? How are they supposed to know is this in the interest of the country? Is, in, is this in the interest of their firm, themselves personally? And the answer is they can't, they can't make those assessments. Now, I think I'm correct that you sent this book off to the publisher before you were aware or anyone else was aware of uh, the coronavirus. Um, and yet with an eerie prescience, uh, you talk about uh, global pandemics in the book. 
and how uh, we somehow or other have to work together with other countries uh, to deal with pandemics. Uh, I know Tip O'Neill said famously, all politics is local, but we've certainly learned that pandemics aren't local. Uh, so uh, is that kind of the COVID, is that kind of a, a case in point, a hanging exhibit for uh, the argument you make in the book? It is, Counselor. It is a how's that, for, how's that for a meatball question? <laughs> <laughs> I like that expression. It's new to me. A hanging exhibit. <laughs> Absolutely. No, this is this is globalization in action. Look, I wasn't the only one who predicted it. Now, I, you know, no one said it was going to be COVID nineteen on this date with these with these genetic details. But I was one of many people who predicted that it was a question of when and not if there would be a global pandemic. We didn't know the exact timing, the exact severity, the exact nature of the virus. But people from Bill Gates to George W. Bush to others said it was coming. We've got to, we've got to pr prepare for it. And by the way, just as an aside, we should, we should not assume this was a one-off. There may be COVID-24 one day. There may be bacteria that emerge that are resistant to, to antibiotics. But this is globalization. Uh, unlike Tip O'Neill, uh, if politics are local, events in the world or not. This didn't stay in Wuhan. The terrorists on 9-11 didn't stay in Afghanistan. Climate change doesn't stay anywhere. It comes from everywhere. It goes everywhere. And this is something we've got to accept. Now, where we could have a serious conversation is what do we do about it? And that's in the realm of foreign policy, public policy. That's where the choice centers in. But globalization, that's a reality. And that's something that I think most Americans have to understand. And the the two things that flow from it, sorry to go on so long, is one is isolationism makes no sense. Globalization is going to happen regardless of whether we're paying attention, regardless of whether we're, we're prepared. And I also argue that unilateralism, acting ourselves, is, is truly suboptimal. These are global challenges. You need collective responses. Uh, this is because we have to accept the reality that pandemics, terrorism, climate change, none of that and there may be other examples, and no, no borders. Uh, we just can't withdraw into ourselves. Absolutely, and the correlate, because it's come up a lot in the last couple of years, is sovereignty is not a defense. We can claim sovereignty till the cows come home, and I understand the political appeal of it, but no amount of American sovereignty declared or what have you protected us against this. Uh, it didn't protect us again on 9-11. On it doesn't pr uh, protect us from climate change. That so we ought to learn from that. You know, the oceans aren't moats. Borders are not impermeable. Sovereignty it can be a meaningful concept, but it, it, it's not. Again, uh, it's not a barrier that can't be pierced by the realities of the modern world. Now, in 2017, when uh, I left off with you, you'd uh, written a book called "A World in Disarray." Here, you seem to be arguing we should try to put it back together. First place, is the world in greater disarray than it was uh, three years ago, in your view? Well, the short answer is yes, it is in greater disarray. The uh, institutions that were already inadequate uh, are three years older and that much more inadequate. The United States has pulled back from the world. We've introduced large elements of uncertainty, unpredictability, uh, un unreliability. China is that much stronger. Russia is that much crankier. North Korea has that many more nuclear weapons and, and missiles. There's that many more refugees and internally displaced persons. So yes, the world is in greater disarray today than it was in three years ago, but it's still recognizable. The, the trends that were in motion then are simply three years uh, farther along. Well, uh, you didn't know about the coronavirus, uh, but uh, the book nevertheless is quite timely, but why did you write it now? I mean, it's something impel you to write it now as opposed to uh, sure. the world as you saw it three years ago? Well, with Disarray, that was, I think, my 10th book about, or ninth book about foreign policy. And all the books that I had written on foreign policy, to a large extent, were aimed at people who were, you might say, were insiders. These were people who were interested in the subject, who were part of the conversation, could be in government, academia, journalism, business. But I was preaching to people who essentially had made the decision to enter the conversation, almost like a chat room. What's so different about this book is I wanted to write it for people who hadn't made that decision, who were outside the traditional foreign policy conversation, outside the Council on Foreign Relations, 
Uh, we're not international relations majors. We're not regularly tuning into a show like yours or Fareed Zakaria's or, or Amanpour on uh, PBS. You know, again, I would hope that the so-called experts and all that w- would find value in this book. And like I said, I learned a lot by, by uh, writing it. But what I wanted to write a book was for a much broader uh, public. And it, it, I worry about what happens if we don't have an informed uh, citizenry. I, I worry how democracy functions. If people don't know enough to hold elected officials or people who want to be elected to account, So when they say X, Y, or Z, I want people to know enough to say, that doesn't sound right. Uh, That's not in my interest. That's not in the country's interest. Or more positively, that sounds great. That does make sense. I understand why this person is is advocating this or that. And I just came to the conclusion, coming back to our previous conversation, that people weren't going to acquire this foundational level of knowledge and understanding and perspective if left to themselves. They weren't necessarily going to get it from high school or college. They weren't going to get it from TV or the internet or from their, their local newspaper. So I made the conscious decision. And I, I'll be honest with you, there's one other thing. Donald Trump represents a departure. Before Trump, if you look at every president from Harry Truman through Barack Obama, Democrats, Ronald Reagan, Dwight Eisenhower, both Presidents Bush, Democrats and Republicans alike, What they had in common was greater than where they disagreed when it came to foreign policy. What's so different about Donald Trump is he's the first president not to be on either side of midfield. He is a departure from the the mainstream of American foreign policy. People may think that's wonderful. They may think it's terrible. I'm more critical, needless to say, than not. But as a result, what it told me is people in my business, what I do for a living, it doesn't make make sense to assume that most citizens, most people would come to the conversation with sufficient background to, to reach informed judgment. So this book, by the way, doesn't tell people what to think. I don't tell people how to vote, what to think, what's the right policy. What I try to do is simply give them enough history, enough background in the global issues, enough background in the regions of the world so they can better reach their own conclusions. Okay, let's uh, try to educate uh, the citizenry right here. Uh, You have said publicly and written that managing China is the most important relationship uh, and challenge that we have in the 21st century. Uh, It really looks as if things are heating up with China that uh, many have said we're in for a Cold War with them. You've written in the Wall Street Journal that it would be a mistake to have a Cold War with China. Has COVID exacerbated the relationship and, uh, and what do you think can be done about it? Look, this was a relationship that was already in trouble long before any of us heard of COVID. I think it was in trouble in some ways uh, because after the Cold War, we lost the rationale for the relationship. We had an anti-Soviet rationale during the Cold War. Once that ended, we turned to economics to build a new foundation. The problem was over time, the economics, rather than being a foundation, became a source of friction increasingly. So this is a relationship, as you say, it's the critical relationship of our era that increasingly lacks a a foundation, increasingly lacks a a rationale. It could become a Cold War. Uh, I think that would be extraordinarily unfortunate for for both countries. I think it would also, to do so, and to place China in opposition to China at the center of our foreign policy would probably be to exaggerate China's capabilities and ambitions. I think it underestimates its internal weaknesses and limits. I also think it it, it loses perspective. We could succeed at pushing back China wherever we must in the South China Sea or Hong Kong or what have you, but that's still not gonna help us deal with the next pandemic or climate change or terrorism or North Korea. And indeed, if we're at loggerheads with China, it may make it harder to deal, say, with a challenge like North Korea. So what I want is a pretty realistic relationship where we can cooperate selectively in areas of some overlap where we're inevitably going to disagree and be competitive. I just don't want the areas of disagreement and competition to spill over and preclude areas of cooperation. So I want a a pretty sophisticated relationship. It's going to take some careful handling on both sides. Uh, Not impossible, but it's not just going to come about. And as you say, I think what the pandemic shows, if things are allowed to drift, they're going to drift downward. 
Well, it's even worse than that because it appears uh, Trump plans to feature in his campaign for re-election uh, the China relationship. He uh, seems to be demonizing China, yep. uh, appealing to xenophobia about China, that China was responsible for the virus. The Secretary of State uh, calls it the Beijing virus. Uh, he says uh, Biden is Beijing Joe. And uh, if there are any issues in this campaign, uh, apart from whether you like Donald Trump or detest Donald Trump, it seems to me that uh, he's put China in as a centerpiece. Now, uh, are the Chinese just going to shrug their shoulders and say this is just campaign rhetoric, or are they going to take it seriously and feel they have to recalibrate? Well, I think they are taking it seriously to some extent. And there's documents that have been either released or leaked out of China that suggest they understand they're in for a tough time with the United States. By the way, not just under President Trump. They also understand that even if Vice President Biden were to be elected this November, a lot of his supporters are quite critical too of China, be it over human rights, over Hong Kong, over the South China Sea, what they're doing there, over uh, trade matters. I would just say though, if I can, about President Trump and China, I think a lot of this is deflection. Look, China is where the virus began. China did mishandle it badly but China can't be blamed for our own lack of uh, protective equipment. China cannot be blamed for the fact that what, five months later, we still don't have a serious national testing capability, that people aren't wearing masks who should, people aren't social distancing who, who should. So I, I think that is, you know, that is simply the beginning of reality. I also say if the president wanted to have a really tough anti-China policy, then why didn't the United States join the Trans-Pacific Partnership? That would have been a political economic grouping that would have given us tremendous leverage against China economically. And it was one of the first decisions he made after getting elected that we wouldn't be part of it. Why is he beating up on the South Koreans and Japanese, our two, two of our three most important allies? How do we get this thing back on track? Because we're creating opportunities for China to have more influence than it deserves in something like the World Health Organization. More broadly, uh, I've dubbed this the withdrawal doctrine. Uh, that essentially, um, it's all to paraphrase Will, you know, Will Rogers, Donald Trump has, has hardly met an international agreement he likes, and instead we're leaving. Now, look, in principle, leaving can be warranted, but only if you've got an alternative that's better. I don't see the better uh, alternatives. I would rather work with partners and allies in reforming these institutions or building new ones. But the president seems to have a certain allergy to multilateral uh, involvement. And again, I think it just diminishes American influence. I think it's bad for our prosperity. I think it's bad for our security, but you're right, 100%. This is one of the hallmarks, one of the patterns that defines Mr. Trump's foreign policy. And, uh, and how about arms control? How dangerous is this? Uh, he gets out of three arms control agreements. He says he's now developing a super duper missile and uh, he's going to enter into a grand agreement with the Russians. The Russians are not going to get rid of nuclear weapons because that's the only area they're still a superpower. Uh, so let's, let's begin with, uh, with that reality. I also say from our point of view, why would, in God's name, would we want to have a new round of strategic nuclear competition? We have all sorts of things we need to spend money on in the military and beyond the military. So why would we want to devote it to nuclear weapons rather than to the kind of forces we're going to use on a, a, a regular uh, basis? The idea that we're going to have arms control also that's going to eliminate all nuclear weapons, that sounds like North Korea and denuclearization. And that's great rhetoric, but it's not, uh, it's not reality. No, look, who's ever, whoever wins this election, a few weeks after he's elected, be it uh, Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden, they're going to have to make the decision about what to do about the expiring major arms control agreement, the START agreement between the United States and Russia. So this administration's already, as you say, pulling out of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty uh, and out of the Open Skies Arrangement. Uh, neither one of those is nearly as important as the Strategic Nuclear Agreement. I think it would be a major mistake for the United States to pull out of it. Let's extend it. And if we have legitimate concerns, uh, given technologies and what Russia is doing and the rest, then let's, let's modify it going forward. Your book, Getting Back to It, is in four parts, 24 chapters. And as you said, it's a, a primer on international affairs. And you begin uh, with the Peace of Westphalia in the 17th century, which you say established a world order, uh, which has really contributed 
up to the present time, and then you raise the question as to whether we're uh, running away from it now. Uh, but uh, what was the liberal world order, and uh, and where does it stand today? No, you're right. It did have its roots back in the 17th century. The whole idea was when modern states came into being, modern countries, that sovereignty was an organizing principle. Essentially, they each government would have authority within its borders. Others were not to interfere, intervene, and you wouldn't try to change the borders by force. But essentially, you would have rules and, and commonly accepted restraints. And also American primacy in the world uh, being undone and being diminished. And uh, other countries uh, seem to be saying a plague on both your houses, uh, maybe mm -hmm. all three, China, Russia, the United States, and maybe establish some kind of new uh, primacy to pick up the fallen standard. Is, uh, yeah. uh, it doesn't really seem likely, but uh, if we're not gonna do it, who is? Well, you're right. American primacy was not an end in itself. It was a means to an end. We were leading to create these institutions to enforce certain uh, rules. We essentially abdicated. Uh, we saw elements of it under the previous Obama administration, and it has accelerated dramatically over the last three plus years. Uh, it wasn't so much that others got that much stronger, though in many cases they did. It's more that we, we essentially decided we don't want to do this anymore. And I think that is a historic mistake. I don't think world order will come from elsewhere, be it from China or from a group, you know, like as well intentioned they are, Europeans, Australia, Canada. Those countries just don't have the, the weight. They just don't have the power to bring to bear. So what worries me is that the alternative to a world that's been led and formed and in some ways shaped by the United States is going to be a world that's going to be increasingly disorganized. So we're not only going to have the re-emergence of all sorts of familiar security challenges like great power rivalry. But I worry about this overlay of these new global issues like pandemics, like climate change, like terrorism, what have you. And we're, we're falling woefully short of building collective uh, responses to these global challenges. And so it's this combination of an old security agenda plus this emerging security agenda. This is, this is uh, a lot coming out of time in the United States has lost its appetite to play a significant international role. You also wrote a book called Foreign Policy Begins at Home. And when other countries see uh, the uh, political polarization in the United States and the dysfunction, uh, which uh, is uh, notorious in Washington, that doesn't really help us uh, lead the world and say we uh, uh, are a credible, uh, a credible leader, does it? No, last you're right in two ways. One is we don't then set an example that others want to follow or emulate. If they see dysfunctional democracy, if they land at one of our airports and it's a mess, if uh, they see you know, all sorts of violence because of guns or deaths because of opioid or I think our terrible performance on COVID-19, the example we set, the standing we have takes, uh, takes, takes a real hit. And I think that is what we are uh, seeing in the world, and then we compound it by simply not wanting to lead, by not wanting to play our traditional role. So this combination of uh, what we're not doing at home, plus our change foreign policy, again, leads to diminish U.S. influence. Okay, well, this conversation has been absolutely marvelous, and I hope it will encourage people to read your book, and I hope it will encourage global literacy, which is so vitally important. And uh, so I have... Uh, a question for you, uh, Richard Haas. Um, are you worried about the state of the world? <laughs> I, know, I, I will admit that my default option is, is, is worried. I'm worried about the state of the country, the divisions. The, I worry about the fabric of American democracy. I don't take it for granted, Jim. That's one of the things I've learned over the last few years is take less for granted. I am worried about the state of the world. There's nothing permanent. It's nothing natural about uh, international order. It's something that has to be constantly worked on and constantly uh, renewed. But I'm not, I haven't reached the point where I'm defeatist. What's what, you know, look, I've been lucky. I've worked for four presidents. And what I've seen time and time again is that people in positions of authority can make decisions that have wonderful consequences, that have wonderful results. So that to me suggests that good things can still happen, whether it's here at home or in the world. 
The pessimist in me says, but don't just assume that. They don't just happen by themselves. And people can make mistakes. We can do too much. We can do too little. We can do the wrong kind of things, what have you. So what I tell young people is, uh, you know, get involved. The system is influenceable. People in positions of power and authority can make a real difference. To me, the question coming out of the pandemic is, will we learn the right lessons that the world matters, what we do and don't do here at home and around the world matters, and will we, will we, will we apply those lessons? The danger is obviously that we don't, we turn inward and what is going on uh, be, be, you know, go, goes from, from bad to worse. But in that sense, our fate, the future are very much in our hands. It really is up to us. It's really up to us. The world matters and we have to learn from the lessons of history. Richard Hostis has been marvelous. Thank you for coming by. Thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more unfortunately, virtual conversations. We hope to be back in the studio before too long. We hope Richard Haas will be back with us again in the studio. And uh, I'm Jim Zirin. Take care, be safe, and all the best.